So hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to preparing for the 2020 SEC reporting season. My name is Cam Wong, and I am here with my colleagues Kimberly Anderson from our Seattle office and Anthony Epps from our Denver office. Welcome on the snowy day, and thank you all of you for making the journey, whether it was through Skyway or through the snow, to be with us in person. And also welcome to our attendees who are online. In today's presentation, we will be covering need-to-know items for the 2020 SEC reporting season, including 10K and proxy developments, a stock exchange update, and then, if time permits, a brief look ahead at SEC rulemaking. After this presentation, we will be circulating supplemental materials, including a simplified DNO questionnaire, our pay ratio checklist, and a link to our blog site with relevant e-updates. I invite everyone, please, um, to sign in for CLE credit, because obviously that's important. And to warn you in advance, we really don't think we're going to get to the looking ahead stuff. We did a practice run. We didn't get there. Yes. Thanks for that dose of reality, Kimberly. <laughs> Moving into the 10K and FAST Act amendments. So in April, the SEC approved a series of amendments to 10K and proxy regulations that are intended to modernize and simplify disclosure requirements. Changes relevant to upcoming filings include a revised 10K cover page, flexible periods for MDNA discussion, updated headings, a streamlined confidential treatment request process, a new exhibit for description of securities, and fewer material contracts as 10K exhibits, which is good news for everyone. So uh, I'd ask you to consult the appendix to this presentation for a more complete summary of changes. Oh, one quick comment on the confidential treatment process. Mm. Just because you no longer have to make the submissions, which I consider to be an excellent development, um, it does not mean that you can just go whole hog and just out, you know, blackout whole pages, paragraphs, et cetera. Same rules apply. You just don't have to make the filing. So um, don't go nuts. Yes, yeah, that's generally a good rule. Don't go nuts. Uh, with regard to the revised cover pages, we found many companies have introduced inline XBRL tagging, as they're supposed to, but they're forgetting to include the reference to the related Exhibit 104. So we've included sample language here for your reference in addition to some guidance on interactive data exhibits, which the SEC updated in August of 2019. And please keep in mind, there is certain information on the cover page that will not be taggable. Um, so the companies, where the company securities are listed and the jurisdiction of incorporation. And these requirements for inline XBRL compliance came about in 2017 uh, when the SEC established tiered compliance deadlines. Uh, so we've included them here for your reference and they depend on the size of the company. Fantastic. So now we're, we're on to risk factors and in MDNA. What's what's interesting is that 2019 has been a very unique year as far as the, there's there's a lot of things happening in the world. And any time that th there's a lot of things that happen, companies need to review their risk factor disclosure and their MDNA disclosure to, to make sure that they're adequately de describing certain risks and certain um, act certain things that may impact their business. So we've we've listed a couple of trending issues ac across various industries. So the first thing is is the trade policy. So trade policy with the tri China trade war and Brexit. Um, but back in March of, of this year, William Hinman, the, the director of, of corporation finance, said, given the complexity of and the uncertainty surrounding Brexit, generic disclosures are insufficient to guide investors in a meaningful manner. So, so the, the SEC is really wanting issuers to, to, to make sure that when it comes to trade policy, risk factor disclosure, and really risk factor disclosure in, in general, that if you know what the risk is, or there are certain risks specific to your company, you need to disclose it. Um, uh, so go ahead. if we're talking about Brexit, um, you know, depending on the industry, uh, you could have widely varying risks, Absolutely. as we discussed before. You could have, if you are perhaps a logistics company, yes. there could be a significant disruption in trading activity. Um, or if one of your major suppliers is in the UK, it could cause you know, um, supply chain Absolutely. concern or potential loss of customers, um, depending on what the, the trade policy seem to be. So for every company, it could have, and for some companies, it really may have very little to no impact also perfectly appropriate. Yeah. Again, it's always going to affect, it really is a, a factual determination 
for the individual company, but try to think of, if you think of Brexit as sort of just a big mess that the UK is gonna have to clean up at some point, not, not an untrue statement, but at the same point, it may provide a significant risk in any uh, a wide number of areas for a lot of companies. Agreed, agreed. Another tra tra training area is, is gonna be data, data privacy and, and cybersecurity. So of course, you've gotta comply with the European Union's uh, general data protection uh, re regulation, or we call it GDPR, or and, and the California Consumer Privacy Act. What's significant uh, about this is that the SEC provided guidance on cybersecurity earlier in the year, and basically that they said that cybersecurity has now become a, a major issue that impacts companies across industries. So if, if you potentially have issues with cybersecurity or you could be a victim of cybersecurity, they care about di disclosure in two areas. One, of course, risk factor disclosure, as, it, as I mentioned before, but, but two, in, in your MDNA. So the SEC, that as, as, as Kimberly and Cam and I were, were talking about before the, the presentation, there really isn't a specific line item in, in a current report on 8K for cybersecurity disclosure. Of course, you can put it under item 801 if it's, if it's really important to get the information out, or you could put it out on, on a 701 uh, press release and, and do the disclosure there. But the, the, the SEC really views at this disclosure as really important, especially if you've had incidents like a spoofing attack, hacking attack, that they want you to, to, to disclose it and let, let investors and stockholders know. Yeah, and that's where, especially where it's crucial to have this type of disclosures, where the risk has come to pass. And so where we see companies like Yahoo and Facebook have gotten in trouble with SEC enforcement, with subsequent litigation, is where they, they did have significant breaches and they failed to disclose them or assess the impact. Absolutely. Um, another training issue are in environmental and, and regulatory risk. Uh, if, if you think about it with the wildfires in, in, in California, you've got more and more companies that are having to, to reassess what their risk factor disclosure says about natural disasters. So if you've got if, if you're an issuer or you represent issuers who have operations in, in locations where natural disasters are a real possibility, that, then it's really important to update that the risk factor disclosure and actually outline what, what, those, what those risks are. Um, you know, another tr trending issue is, is that definitely government policy, specifically immigration. I immigration it can impact businesses in ways that you, that you don't always think about. And in industries that you that you don't always think about, yeah. like we were talking about it before, um, uh, our firm assists a number of tech companies in the Pacific Northwest with respect to immigration issues because they bring in a wide number of employees from various countries who are coming into the United States and working. So, um, you know, and obviously it would also probably you know impact many types of agricultural um, in, uh, companies as well. But it can hit a wide variety of companies if there is going to be any kind of a limitation on the number of people who can come in to um, assist companies, particularly if they have a uh, traditionally a strong reliance on uh, immigration for specialized Absolutely. Uh, issues. And in immigration and other areas of government policy, there's just going to be a large degree of uncertainty as we move towards the election. So think about immigration and think about other areas of policy that impact your business. Last uh, tr tr training area is is going to be the LIBOR uh, tr transition. A anyone who deals with with debt securities, debt capital markets, or even banking and and credit facilities and debt facilities, uh, LIBOR has been the standard for 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 longer than I've been alive. So what's what's si significant about that is the SEC back in June pr pr provided kind of an update to companies or guidance to companies, telling them that if you have contracts that that reference LIBOR and, and they're gonna extend past the LIBOR transition date to actually look, look at those, make sure that, that there's an alternate um, a, alternate way to, to, to calculate things if, if LIBOR is gonna, gonna hold up the contract and it's not easily amended, then the, then the SEC says there's potential risks there. And so you, you would need to disclose whatever risk factors you think 
are, are relevant to you. And in, in addition to that, you're also going to have to update your MDNA because a lot of MDNAs are going to include information about we've got this credit facility, we've drawn down th this amount, but it also includes interest rates and other information that that th that the removal or the transition from LIBOR is is very important. So it's not j just a risk factor disclosure. You're also going to have to disclose it in your MDNA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For many of our clients in the banking and financial services sectors, they are well on their way in preparing for this transition with regard to their products. Absolutely. So I said some drafting tips for, for risk factors and MDNA, but more specifically to, to risk factors, use descriptive captions for the risk and its impact. I've, I've always used risk factors as, as your insurance policy. So it's always a really good, good, good idea to make sure they're there, make sure people can easily find them and that they understand what's going on. Second thing is, is re review peer risk factors. Uh, a, a lot of times, a lot of times you won't always know every risk that faces your industry unless you look at what risks that your competitors or your peers are also disclosing. And then you, you can evaluate wh whether those risks are applicable to you. But just like anything with risk factors, your risk factors are yours. So they need to be narrowly tailored to your specific in uh, your specific situation. So you can't just cut, cut and paste. Cut, cut and paste. Yeah. No, darn it. Um, uh, li limit the, the, the discussion to, to risk versus mitigation. Uh, what, one trend that, that Cam, Kimberly, and I have, have seen over the years is, is a, lot, a lot of issuers will, will say, here's my risk. That they'll state what the risk is in one small sentence. Then they'll go paragraph after paragraph within the risk factor, basically saying how it's it's kind of a risk, but it's not really because they're going to be doing. Because we've solved it. Yes, yes, all, all this other stuff. That's not helpful, and it's not something that's that, that's useful to in, to investors, and it kind of takes away from the insurance policy nature of of risk factors. If you say here's the risk, but I'm doing all, all these things. However, as we were discussing, you know, companies can be very thoughtful, especially if there is a significant risk. They may have taken a number of actions to either help address it or, or be in a position to address it. So um, what we have seen is you have the risk factor, absent the mitigating language, and then uh, with sometimes a cross-reference if there is a specific discussion. If, there's, if it's a very specific risk factor, you could cross-reference for more information about a particular topic you could cross-reference to another uh, point so it would be useful for investors so they understand where they might be able to find more information about that topic. Absolutely. And then an abstract discussion is, it is never going to be enough. You always need to be as specific as possible. As I talked about but before with Brexit, you can't just say Brexit may affect my industry or may affect my business. If there's specific aspects of the uncertainty surrounding Brexit that, that are real risks to the company, you need to disclose that rather than, than it in abstract. And what, when in doubt, d d disclose the risk and just, just use cautionary language in, in other sections of your 10K or, or your 10Q. But, but, but always default rule is, is disclose, disclose, disclose. Yeah. Though please don't write a book. Yeah. Yep. Always good. Many of these points Anthony's making, they show up in the proposed rulemaking for principles-based disclosure, concise risk factors avoidance of boilerplate specific to the company. So we'll continue to see these themes as the SEC pr proceeds with that rulemaking. All right. So um, as I had warned Cam and Anthony before, I considered this to be an excellent point for most people to check their phones and see if their email was up to date. But we're going to go through it anyway because it is important and it is hitting large accelerated filers this year or anyone who has a fin um, so, uh, sorry, for audits for uh, fiscal years ending on or after um, June 30, 2019, for large accelerated filers. So we've already had a few reports. These are critical audit matters. So just to start out, a critical audit matter, um, this is not, we're not talking about significant deficiencies. We're not talking about material weaknesses. This is actually a critical audit matter. Is any going to matter that, re re that arises from the audit of financial statements? that's communicated or required to be communicated with the audit committee and has to relate to accounts or disclosures that are material to financial statements and involve challenging, subjective, or complex auditor judgment. In other words, this is the stuff that sort of makes management and the auditors sort of sit mm -hmm. down, scratch their heads, and make sure that they all got the accounting right. Um, and so uh, the, the rules mean that the, they're going to have to be you know, talking with the auditors about this 
And uh, the PCAOB is, is flat out said, they said, we are expecting really every company to have at least one of these. Um, it, it, you know, you're not required to have one or otherwise, but they are expecting that, that most companies will have at least one. The requirements for the disclosure of your critical audit matter um, only apply to the current audit period. However, for financial statements where there are comparative numbers, and there, there are, um, it can uh, cover a prior period if that's considered appropriate. But really, the focus for the critical audit matter is going to be on the current period. Um, and then the big question for management after they determine if there is a critical audit matter is, does this result in some type of additional disclosure, particularly in MD&A mm -hmm. um, discussion, many times when there is a discussion of your critical uh, accounting policies, if there should be additional discussions there. Um, so it can impact more than just the audit report. So with respect to um, a critical audit matter, we've already talked about what it is, but many of the <coughs> accounting firms have indicated that for large accelerated filers that have either already done these or are going to be in the midst of them, um, they'll do dry runs with their auditors. So they'll meet with the, with the audit committees and management regarding, you know, what are you thinking is going to be a critical audit matter? How do we think the disclosure is going mm -hmm. to go? So it, when it really comes time to it, there's, this is not going to be a surprise right at the end when the audit committee is, is, is doing their kind of their meeting with the auditor. There should be nothing about this, particularly in that first year, that's going to be, or there should be no surprises. Um, so uh, we did note, and I have not, I have not looked at this, but I don't know necessarily, but this could mean in uh, accelerated or, or uh, slightly higher fees for your accountants, but you know, that's just speculation on my part. Well, and Kimberly, it's still early, but what type of disclosure are you seeing? Like, what's the scale? And yeah, I, you know, there isn't, a, we, there haven't been that many so far. Um, we've gone through sort of, you'll see here, the, the first round of uh, uh, client uh, audit, uh, critical audit matters have come out from the June uh, 30, that was the first set. Um, the biggest ones that we're seeing are the ones that you would expect. Sort of the big three are goodwill and intangible assets, revenue and income taxes, because of course with revenue, there have been a number of changes with revenue recognition, um, and with the income tax, income tax reform that has been, that have really uh, required sort of additional thought, et cetera. So, you know, these are, it's not surprising that these are the top three that, that you're seeing. And many of these already had some fairly significant disclosure with them already. So um, we haven't seen you know, significant additional disclosure, but of course the discussion does show up in the audit reports. So Kimberly, would you expect uh, with, with these new critical audit matters for this to add time to, to, to the audit process where companies should reach out to their auditors sooner that, that, than they normally would? Or do you think this will have very little impact on the whole timing process when it comes to an audit? In, in terms of the, the audit itself, I think this will add additional time spent okay. with your auditors because there will be, especially the first time you're going through it, there is going to be significant discussion about you know, what might constitute a critical audit matter, okay. um, what that disclosure is going to look like, the conversations for the education process, because this is this kind of disclosure is new, but these aren't changing accounting standards. It's not changing you know, the um, uh, the decision making on you know goodwill and intangibles, for example, um, has it changed? It's really the disclosure. So there are going to be aspects of it that will, I think, take longer, particularly the first time, as everyone is kind of up to speed as to what we think this disclosure will look like. Okay. But I don't. But in terms of you know, if there is a concern on that, I think um, the finance group should probably reach out to their auditors to discuss this well in advance. Okay. Though I have no doubt the accountants are reaching out first. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it seems like the focus here is really to highlight areas of significant judgment. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, well, let's keep going. So, um, SEC comment letter trends. Um, obviously, the single most SEC co uh, important SEC comment letter you get is the one that's addressed to you. Um, however, um, comment letter trends can be informative in terms of what the SEC is thinking about. Um, where you may want to pay, um, spend additional time and attention. And so it's, it can be useful to look at the trends. Um, the SEC is required to look at each registrant once every three years. So in fact, every year in their plan, the SEC says our target is to review 33% of filings because that is what they are required to do. 
However, um, in 2018, it was 57% of registrants were reviewed. Now, that's not to say they all got comment letters. Um, and in the year before that, I think it was like 56 or 58%, but about the same thing. So the SEC does typically review well over half. Um, the number of comment letters is declining fairly significantly, in fact. Uh, but the, um, it's declining very quickly with respect to non-accelerated filers. So the smaller filers are getting fewer of them. The large accelerated filers have increased from 55% in 2015 to 65%. So the bigger companies are getting a bit more of the time and attention of the SEC when it comes to uh, comment letters. Um, e and Y currently expects, as we discussed before, there's going to be increased attention on things like Brexit and LIBOR as those face out, as well as um, the new accounting standards. Uh, but just to give you a quick analysis of the recent rankings of where the SEC is focusing its attention, revenue recognition is currently number one. Um, Non-GAAP is a perennial favorite. Um, so that's something that, of course, you should always be thinking about. We will remind you that while uh, people do like to include certain kinds of non-GAAP financial measures in their proxy statement for like performance measures and so on, which is a perfectly fine way to use a non-GAAP measure and doesn't require reconciliation in that limited context. Again, going back to the phrase, don't go nuts, um, your proxy statement, uh, if you want to use other types of non-GAAP numbers or non-GAAP numbers in a ways separate from those measurements, they do all of the standard Things apply, again, with in terms of significance of gap numbers over non-gap numbers, the reconciliations, et cetera. So before you start randomly adding non-gap numbers to your proxy statement, just be careful and think about the use and whether or not you're complying with the rules. The SEC does know this. Um, so most of these are, you know, there's some minor adjustments in terms of what the SEC is focusing on. Again, I was telling Cam, but I'm still amazed that state sponsors of terrorism is still ranking number seven. But, um, you know, the, the top ten don't tend to change much. Our speculation on the signatures, exhibits, and agreements, and I have not done a survey on exactly what that is, but you are required to hyperlink. Um, and it could be that in terms of the agreements and exhibits, the SEC is just paying closer attention to those. Yeah, because of the co new confidential treatment request process, it's streamlined. So that's actually the one new item on this list, uh, the signatures, exhibits, and agreements. So uh, moving on to the <coughs> proxy statement. Fantastic. So the, the first thing we're, we're going to talk about is the hedging policy disclosure. So it, it, it's set something new that that a, a lot of companies are going to have to address in their proxies and information statements that are c coming up in 2020. But anytime you're dealing with new disclosure, the first question you always have is, does it apply to me? D if, if I'm an issuer, do I have to be concerned about this? And the short answer is probably yes. Um, uh, all companies with securities registered under, under Section 12 uh, of the Exchange Act are, are subject uh, to, to the new hedging disclosure. Um, usually, small reporting companies and emerging growth companies typically don't have to do or, or provide updated and new disclosure, but this is not the case with the hedging policy disclosure. It applies to small reporting companies and emerging growth companies, but it doesn't apply to foreign private issuers or listed closed-end investment companies. And the, the, the significance of being a, a smaller reporting company or an emerging growth company when it comes to this is that it, it comes down to the compliance deadlines. So the hedging policy disclosure is required in proxy and information statements, which include a proposal for the election of directors during fiscal years beginning on or after July 1st, 2019. So that's most companies, but then smaller reporting companies don't have to worry about this disclosure until July 1st of 2020. However, we would recommend that small reporting companies to do it in next year's proxy because when when you're doing disclosure, sometimes you, you forget, especially when you're relying on forms and, and it just goes year after year. So, so it's always easier to to address it up front rather than rather than kick the can down the road. So what's what's interesting about the the, the hedging policy di di disclosure is that the, the SEC is really concerned about 
two things. One is, do you have have a policy or not? If you, if you don't have a policy, the SEC is not making a judgment one way or another, whether you should or you shouldn't. If you don't have a hedging policy, that they just require you in your proxy statement to disclose that you don't have one. But if, if well, you- Well, and that because you don't have one, yes. people are permitted to hedge. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. Which may be the sentence that no one wants to put in. <laughs> Absolutely, and then if you, if, if you do have, have a hedging policy, that they want you to disclose what the material terms of that policy is. So, so that's gonna be who it covers, what it prohibits. What's interesting though is a lot of companies already have hedging disclosure policies on the books already. It, it, it may not be a separate hedging policy, but a lot of the prohibition against hedging you're gonna find in a company's insider trading policy mm -hmm. and, 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 and other policies. So it's not a situation where we, where we expect a lot of issuers to say, oh wow, we've gotta, we've gotta adopt this, we don't have it, what do we do? It's really gonna be a disclosure item and something that, that they're gonna to have to disclose in their, in their proxy and in their in their information statement if it's if, if if that that's what it is. This could be a very short sentence. All hedging by all of our employees, officers and directors are strictly prohibited. Yeah. It's it, in fact that's of the I'm not sure I actually have work with any clients that have a hedging policy that's permitted or even allows exceptions. Yeah, I agree. I, but I think the SEC does want examples of instruments that are covered. And also the call item does ask whether um, the policy applies to the company's subsidiaries, which, I mean, for most companies, that's just irrelevant. You have a wholly owned subsidiary, you know, who's hedging against their securities, but there are companies out there with publicly traded subsidiaries. Absolutely. What's, what, what's interesting about the, the, the hedging policy debt to disclosure is that, is that let, let's say, but for example, you have a hedging policy, but it doesn't cover all of your employees the SEC is not going to require you in your proxy to say, we have a hedging policy, here's who it covers, but then we also don't have a hedging policy that covers this small subset. That They're not going to re require you to do it. The SEC gives you broad, broad discretion on where you're going to put the hedging disclosure. A lot of companies are probably going to put it in, in a CDNA, that that, that would be, be the logical choice. But for smaller reporting companies, that, that they can put it anywhere they want. And, and la but lastly, what's, what's also interesting to note is that a lot of issuers, what, what they'll do is they'll incorporate by reference part three in the form 10K to, to, to their proxy, but some issuers don't do that. They'll actually physically drop in part th three information. The, the SEC says when it comes to this hedging policy disclosure, you do not have to put it in, in, in your 10K. It's, it's really for a proxy and an information statement. What's also interesting is the SEC doesn't define uh, the, the term hedge, and, and we all think they probably did, did that intentionally mm -hmm. for, for, for companies to, to figure out what that means. But long story short, hedging is basically uh, acquiring or exchanging one security to, to, to hedge against the loss of the equity set securities of, of, of a company. So, mm -hmm. so that, that's what the SEC is trying to, trying to not necessarily prevent. I think they want people to disclose it more than anything else. Yeah, and in the policies for um, when we've been reviewing them recently with respect to having these in mind, companies tend to also define hedging um, really quite broadly yeah. to be as broad as possible. So it's not just it's this, this, or this type of instrument. It's like many times those are examples, but it's including, but not limited yeah. to. And it really is anything that allows, it's essentially a bet against the company. Yep. Um, and so, uh, and many, and many times it's explained that way. So people understand why this type of transaction yeah. is prohibited. All right. CEO pay ratio in year three. Um, so, uh, some people consider this highly relevant. I, I do not consider this to be a useful measure, but it doesn't mean that it's not required and it doesn't mean that people don't read it. So, um, CEO pay ratio in year three. So, uh, the rules have not changed. So we're not going to go through an entire analysis of what this means, how you do it, et cetera. Um, I think our, uh, pay ratio checklist is going to be distributed right. um, as well. So if you want to look at it again as a refresher, that will be coming out uh, in materials following the, the in an email. 
But we're in year three, which means that about 35% of the people, of the, of the issuers, use the same employee from year one to year two. So remember, you have to figure out who your median employee is. Our median employee is Anthony. Anthony is a median employee. He's probably not, but nonetheless, he's just easy to point to. <laughs> so, um, and so in year one, you do your analysis, you determine who your median employee is. This is not a hypothetical person, it's Anthony. Yeah. And so you are allowed to continue to use him for three years. So, you know, the first year and then two more years after that. So this is the last year that we could conceivably cite Anthony as our median employee. And then the next year, we would have to do a new calculation. Uh, may still be Anthony, but nonetheless, you would have to. You can only use it for three years. About 35% of the people use the same employee from year one to year two. They may decide to use it to year three, but at some point, it begins to get possibly a little stale. Because remember, you have to, you can only use that um, median employee, um, that, that calculation, unless you have significant, significant changes to the employee population, um, employee compensation arrangements, um, or if Anthony's circumstances change significantly enough that we no longer think that he's the appropriate median employee. So if you decide to use the same one again, um, or, in fact, maybe you change from year one to year two, but you want to use, again, that kind of resets your clock. You want to use that one again. You would have to disclose the basis for your belief that um, no change occurred that would significantly impact the pay ratio. Yeah. I'm curious, Kimberly, and Anthony, too. How many of your clients just voluntarily recalculate the median employee every year? Uh, well, none of mine have. Yeah. Either because they're a very large organization and it was difficult to it was difficult to do so, um, or it's a very very small population and there hadn't been I mean there were 13 employees, and so it was it happened to be the same. So um, and they knew there wasn't a significant change, so I don't think they bothered. Or if they did, there wasn't a change. Yeah, I asked because a lot of my clients just just do it because they have the infrastructure set up. Mm -hmm. So there must be a wide variety of practice yeah. with that regard. But I mean, keep in mind. So there's two things to consider if you're if we're going to use Anthony again. One, has anything changed with respect to Anthony? Has he uh, been promoted? Um, has he changed division? So he's gone from operations over to sales, which might mean that his compensation arrangements would change dramatically um, because his whole compensation structure changes. Um, has he been fired? You wouldn't be. Um, but if he has been, obviously, you're picking someone new. Um, or when you look at the employee base as a whole, have you done any significant layoffs or acquisitions that are going to cause your base to change? Or have you decided to change compensation structures such that it creates that significant change that you may have to um, reconsider who that base is? So those are things that you need to think about if you decide, um, if you're just going to rerun it every year, uh, no worries. We're on to the evil empire. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> ISS. Yes. Uh, so I, I, ISS, every, every year, just like Glass Lewis, they come up with their, their, their new evil empire type of, type of voting guidelines every year. And so this year, ISS did some updates, but then they clarified some of their positions on, on some things. Mm -hmm. so, so, so the first thing is that ISS clarified their their position on new nominees and uncontested elections. So ISS's current policy when it comes to um, pr proposals re relating to uncontested elections of, of directors is usually when it comes to to, to nominees, they'll say, hey, it's, it, it, it's a no if they're new. But ISS says that's really not our policy. It's really on a case-by-case -case basis. But new nominees is a small subset so for iss a new nominee is someone who has only been at the company for for less th than a year so all they did was clarify that their position that that new nominees is really a, only a subset and that subset is folks who have only been there for for, for less th than a year that then we have di different things that iss may recommend against it directors so once again absence of a board uh, gender diversity that was previously announced and that now it's effective mm -hmm. uh poor board meeting attendance however with the poor board meeting attendance they just clarified that once again that this is not 
designed to encompass new nominees. So oftentimes companies right before their annual meeting, maybe a couple months before, will, will, will nominate someone who hasn't been on the board for but before. So I assess that they're saying we can't hold that person accountable for the eight board meetings that, that they weren't there. Um, uh, ISS is really concerned with newly public companies and problematic governance structures. So super majority voting, different um, uh, classified board structure and other what they consider to be egregious provisions. Um, and then ISS is really concerned about uh, what, what they consider to be problematic capital structures. So multi-class capital structures with un equal voting rights. What's what's interesting uh, about that is this that this can come up in a couple of in a couple of scenarios. But but one that I can think of is sometimes you'll have companies that go public not via like a traditional up IPO, but they'll do a reverse merger or some sort of other transaction where, where they're basically relying on a private company's form of bylaws, a private company's form of articles or certificate of incorporation, which is fine for a private company, but ISS doesn't like to see that for, for, for public companies, especially when those provisions don't have timely sunset provisions. So some companies will say, we've got this structure, but after after a year, we're, we're going to get rid of it. And, and not everyone does that. And both of you have industry-specific experience with capital structure, don't, don't you? Yes, on, um, we've done a number of, uh, in the cannabis industry, many times they'll go public in Canada with ultimately the goal of being a registered company, um, reporting company in the United States, um, and uh, some of the tax structures, they're very complicated tax structures, and some of those do have um, multi-vote provisions and so on for any number of reasons, sometimes it's tax, sometimes it's it's uh, for other governance type of provisions um, or you know foreign private issuer status. So we see it in a number of ways where the, the purpose is not to um, negatively impact the shareholders, just but that there are other benefits to shareholders that are um, impacted by the actual capital structure. Okay. So my goal of pitching the cannabis practice group has been achieved. There Please you go. Please carry on. <laughs> and we appreciate it. Thank you very Thank much, you. Ken. <laughs> Fantastic. And, and, and then lastly, undo restrictions on shareholders' ability to amend bylaws. Uh, ISS d d does not like that. They, they believe that your shareholders should have uh, f free reign and an easier ability to amend your bylaws. So th this, th this brings us to, to, to quickly ju to just a couple of uh, codifications of existing policies. So, so ISS is usually going to recommend a four vote if a company has a proposal where they want to set up an independent board chair. Uh, so some of the factors that they codified was if a company has a majority non-independent board, that, that they'll definitely recommend a four vote. Or if there's a scenario where they feel like the executive team isn't looking out for the best interests of the shareholders and that the board should have uh, stopped certain actions, they'll also re recommend a four vote. Um, a, ISS will, will usually recommend a four vote for share repurchase programs, so long as those share repurchase programs um, are, are equally applied to, to, to shareholders. They'll, they'll view it on a case-by-case -case basis if your uh, share repurchase plan actually targets a specific shareholder mm -hmm. because it, they, they want to see if you're implementing the share repurchase program for, for nefarious reasons. And the, 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 the biggest update, in, in, in my view, is that a, a ISS is now going to recommend um, and against any sort of equity compensation plan that, that has evergreen provisions. So, so the, this, this is re really relevant for, for a lot of uh, cross-border um, du dualistic Canadian mm -hmm. issuers who a lot of the, their their equity incentive plans have have these evergreen provisions, which all an evergreen provision is, is that basically it says, okay, the, the, the number of shares that, that are going to be covered by, by our plan is going to be 20% of our issued and outstanding shares. So, so, so it automatically rounds up and, and goes up as, as the company moves forward. ISS views that as taking away a uh, shareholder's ability to be able to to, to, to vote on, on plans and plans amendments. Well, and the reason for this is because it used to be that you'd have to get shareholder approval many times for 162M every five years. 
because um, the exchange is only required for evergreen plans once every 10 yep. years. And so ISS was concerned that you're suddenly limiting shareholder impact. Um, many, uh, many companies that have these um, are, um, have other requirements other, under, for example, uh, the Toronto Stock Exchange would require an evergreen approval every three years. Um, so it could be that if you are a company with an evergreen provision, and I've worked with both Canadian and U.S. Mm -hmm. incorporated companies that have these, that they should carefully consider, one, um, keeping these, or two, if you do want to keep these, you know, um, if you have any requirements to get it for, you know, shareholder approval every three years, that you explicitly mm -hmm. state it, that yes, we are required to seek this, that might help alleviate the, cons the overriding concern by ISS. Yeah. You know, promises, but it, it can't hurt to put that in. Yeah. I mean, these evergreen provisions are increasingly rare here in the U.S., but you're saying they're common, if not prevalent in oh, Canada? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's odd not to have them. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Hmm. Yep. And, and, and lastly, I, ISS updated their, their, their policy on, on diversity and gender pay gap, basically to include race or ethnicity pay gaps in, in the voting policy. Glass Lewis. Um, I, it's a... Uh, some people, I think ISS probably gets most of the attention, but Glass-Lewis is another one of the major proxy advisory firms. Um, they've issued their guidelines. Some of them are a little bit odd because we just have a hard time seeing how they would ever really apply. For example, they'll recommend against the audit committee chair when the fees paid to the external auditor are not disclosed. That is required disclosure. So unless you're going to decide not to disclose the required disclosure, you'll never have this problem. Um, but um, another one that we have not really seen a concern with is they'll recommend against the members of the comp committee if they're going to adopt a say on pay frequency other than the one approved by a plurality of members. So for example, it, shareholders. So if the shareholders say, you know, when they have their say on frequency vote, they prefer annual. And, you know, the comp committee says, you know, we, we just really think that every two years is more appropriate and more informative, et cetera, and we think that's good enough. If they adopt every two years over every year, that is something that would cause the recommend against. Now, I must admit, I have not seen, yeah, seen you know, I've always seen the board follow the, the preference yeah. of shareholders on that point, mm -hmm. but nonetheless. Um, or there's, again, they um, reiterated that they disfavor executive agreements that have um, excessive severance payments, um, gross ups, uh, you know, single trigger change of controls. All of these are becoming increasingly rare um, and I, I will admit, I, I will occasionally joke about the proxy advisory firms, but one of the reasons they're increasingly rare is because they have publicly stated that these are things that they consider to be um, out of favor. And so that does impact um, compensation committee um, uh, practices. Um, all right, nominated and governance committee. Again, they'll recommend against the chair if the uh, director's records for board and committee attendance aren't disclosed, they are required to be disclosed. So again, if you're just not going to make your, if you're not going to disclose as required under the proxy rules, this should not be a problem for you. Now here's the one uh, that might be a little more interesting for people because of the new policy of the SEC. They'll recommend against members of the governance committee so that if the SEC, you know, if the company decides to exclude a shareholder proposal, the SEC has said, we're not going to take a view, hands off. So if the SEC decides they're not going to take, take a view, they decline to state a view, and you decide to, just, to exclude it, you do so at your peril. Because I think that will just, you know, that's just going to trigger um, a recommend against, and directors just don't like that. Um, the other one is if you get, um, if the company provides an oral response to you, and they'll indicate on their website whether or not they're providing a letter. The company does need to provide disclosure of what that response actually is. Um, if, you, you know, if you exclude a proposal, but you're not providing disclosure of what the SEC said, that can also trigger a recommend against. And just by the way, ISS policy on the same matter is pending. Um, let's see. And then next one. Um, the supermajority vote requirements, this is primarily a, um, an issue for controlled companies that they'll recommend against shareholder proposals that seek to eliminate, it, eliminate supermajority voting provisions. They'll recommend against those if that's something for a controlled company. Um, and then again, for gender pay equity, um, as we were discussing, companies ha tend to have more and more of this information at their disposal. So 
they'll review on a case-by-case -case basis if there is a shareholder proposal relating to disclosure of median gender pay ratios, um, as opposed to, for example, proposals about information adjusted based on job title, mm -hmm. tenure, geography, mm -hmm. or things like that, which um, either companies may not have at their disposal as well, or just may not be, um, uh, that might require a bit either more work or, or otherwise, but that one is, uh, they would be likely to recommend against that. Um, or if a company, and this is really kind of, this is the carrot, um, they'll recommend against proposals if companies have disclosed sufficient, sufficient information concerning diversity initiatives, as well as information concerning how they're ensuring that men and women are paid equally for equal work. So um, if you have, you know, this is really kind of an incentive for companies to actually voluntarily put that um, uh, information uh, regarding their diversity initiatives in their proxy statements. Um, and so we may be, you know, seeing sort of more, more of that and more um, detail about that sort of going forward. Because again, as these voting policies kind of take effect, I think it, you know, eventually it impacts disclosure. Oh, company responsiveness. So um, if your SAN pay gets less than 80%, um, you should be talking to your shareholders. You should be reaching out to your shareholders. The board should be talking to shareholders um, and you know, discussing you know, what engagement they considered, um, where it was reasonable, implementing changes that address concerns. So um, you know, those are things that I think it's appropriate for companies to do anyway. Oh, and then um, Glass-Lewis also um, issued an etiquette guide, and it is actually called an etiquette guide. Um, Emily Post would be proud. But um, last year, they piloted something called a report feedback statement. So if Glass-Lewis provides an analysis and you disagree, you are you're allowed to provide a statement, and they would actually send your statement to their client, their Glass-Lewis investor clients as well, um, but they did put out a reminder. It does have to comply with Regulation um, FD, um, and so it, it can only be based on publicly available information. You must, in good faith, uh, make an effort to ensure that all statements are accurate, which is frankly a good reminder for every public statement made by a company. And you have to exercise, as they put it, an appropriate level of decorum and civility. So um, anyway, so that is uh, the, the Glass-Lewis Etiquette Guide. Um, with respect to uh, responses. I'm glad to hear civility isn't dead, Kimberly. Yes. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, we'll skip that one. Okay. okay. Uh, just a quick touch on director election trends. So, you know, the percentage of directors who are receiving higher levels of votes against their candidacy uh, are still very small, but it continued to rise in 2019. And in fact, among Russell 3000 uh, shareholder meetings held in the first half of 2019, 45 directors failed to receive majority support uh, versus 36 in 2018. According to data provided by CII, 89% of directors who received less than majority support in 2018 remained on boards, which is striking. And CII calls these directors zombie directors, uh, and they are listed on their website for all of the members to track. And so what we're seeing here is that investors are becoming incrementally more discriminating in their director voting policies. And what's driving votes against? Uh, I think the main reason continues to be that directors are not responding appropriately to poor say on pay vote results. A second reason might be that investors are starting to vote against directors to promote board diversity. Uh, the third reason that we would like to highlight because it may involve additional action for our clients this year is that uh, investors and proxy advisory firms are becoming more stringent in their overboarding policies. So um, if they haven't already, companies should survey their investors' overboarding policies, their current corporate governance board guidelines on other board service, and their directors' commitments, um, because we are seeing investors adopt these types of board service limitations, not just for their CEO, but also for NEOs, for audit committee members. And these standards are often more restrictive than what ISS or Glass-Lewis would propose. And then uh, we'd just like to touch quickly on uh, what are some fairly significant developments in the no action letter process for this year. So in September, the Division of Corporation Finance announced that the staff may respond orally instead of writing to some shareholder proposal no action requests beginning with this proxy season. 
Furthermore, the staff may now more frequently decline to state a view on the no action request, where in the past it had typically concurred or disagreed with the company's asserted basis for exclusion. The staff still intends to issue a response letter where it believes doing so would provide value, such as more broadly applicable guidance about complying with Rule 14A8. So as background, this new process was really born out of the government shutdown, uh, where faced with a large backlog of no action letter requests, the staff responded orally and decided actually they like the system better, so let's stick with it. Um, in a recent corporate counsel presentation, David Fredrickson, who's the chief counsel for Corp Fin, stated that to the extent there are routine matters that are well settled in prior letters, the informal response will be appropriate. And so we think about procedural and eligibility challenges as the classic examples of cases where the SEC will respond orally now. But he said, where there are novel cutting edge issues, the staff may write or decline to state a view. So what's gonna be a novel cutting edge issue? Um, Bill Hinman in July commented that certain ordinary business exclusion requests will continue to receive written requests. Mm -hmm. And I believe that there are matters of state and federal law, um, such as arbitration, where the SEC may say, we're gonna step off. This isn't really our area. Uh, when will the staff de decline to state a view at all? So David Fredrickson couldn't say how often that's gonna happen. He was kind of coy about that. Um, but he did say that there are gonna be a few instances every year where um, the staff is wading into a social debate where they, as securities lawyers, really aren't qualified to wade in, okay? Um, and so in those situations, the staff may withdraw and let the chips fall where they may. Uh, he emphasized that the SEC's refusal to state a view is, is not a no. But please keep in mind what Kimberly discussed with the glass lewis procedure. I mean, even if the SEC declines the state of view, that doesn't give the permission to the company in glass Lewis's view to exclude that proposal. So uh, the brand new no action letter process that the Division of Corporation of Finance unveiled in November, um, where they uh, officially began to post their responses um, to the SEC website. And the first no action letters they responded to were Oshkosh and Qualcomm. And what involved is that the staff um, sent emails to these companies with their decision, uh, or said that the decision would be posted soon on the SEC website. And as you can see from this chart, what they post is the name of the company and the shareholder, the date of the initial submission, the basis asserted by the company, the staff's response, the date of their response, and whether there was a written response. And then there are links to all of the related correspondence for the no action requests. And you want to show them what that looks like? Oh, yeah, sorry. So if the staff concurs that the proposal may be excluded, uh, the staff would cite the basis for its decision. Um, but if it denies the request, then uh, it won't concur with any of the bases. And Deputy Director Shelley Parrott said that the staff plans to update the new chart you know, once, once or twice every week. Uh, we're not going to go into too much detail here, but for um, the third year in the row, uh, the SEC has issued guidance on the ordinary basis, ordinary business basis for exclusion and when board analysis is appropriate. Uh, and I think this is happening is because the staff has encouraged issuers to include a board analysis in certain circumstances, and these attempts have met with very limited success. And so they're trying to provide additional guidance as to when and how to incorporate board analysis into an ordinary business no action request. And what they're saying is, first of all, um, board analysis isn't required for all requests. There are certain areas where clearly it's a day-to-day -day issue like customer relations or products selected for sale. Um, but board analysis is useful where it's not clear whether the issue is significant to the company. And so a couple of factors that the SEC highlighted and that companies may use is a delta analysis between the shareholder proposal and prior company actions. So if the company has taken some action on the policy issue, but it's not sufficient to argue substantial implementation, you know, they should still talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, and the staff also addressed how companies should address prior voting on the issue. And so what the staff is looking for here is the company's view on significance as informed by shareholder engagement. So how has the company engaged with its uh, investors on this topic? What they're not looking for 
is a simple statement that, you know, the voting results weren't significant because they weren't a majority of the votes. Okay. That will fall on deaf ears. So what we'd like to do now is actually skip ahead to a stock exchange update because while it may not impact reporting, there are a number of significant updates for issuers. So I'm Absolutely. going to turn it over to Anthony. Absolutely. Thank you, Kim. So the, the, the biggest update that this year is, is going to come from, from NASDAQ. NASDAQ de decided to, to revise their initial listing standards. We're now that they're bringing in the concept of restricted securities into the calculation of publicly held shares, market value of publicly held shares, and round lot shareholders. The, the, the reason this, this is significant is because NASDAQ is taking a very narrow, narrow position on what they consider to be restricted securities. So what they're saying is if you issued securities in a Regulation D, private placement, and those shares have not been registered, those are restricted. If you have issued securities in a Reg S offshore transaction, those are restricted. If, if they're restricted as defined under Rule 144, they're restricted. And, if, and the only way you can, the only shares that count for these calculations now are, are unrestricted shares. So they'll consider shares that, that were issued in public offerings or shares that, that have been registered on a resale re registration statement. That, that the reason that this is important is, is NASDAQ for the last three to four years has been very concerned with, with the level of liquidity of, of some of the companies that trade on NASDAQ. And, and they've mentioned before, what, we're concerned that some of these companies, their securities are not liquid, therefore, when they trade, they, it's not an accurate representation of what their value is. And, and so NASDAQ is doing this to kind of weed out companies that, that, that they don't think have, have what it takes to be, to be a NASDAQ, NASDAQ company, so that's important. Um, on the next page, uh, NASDAQ, they, they, they proposed a rule in, in November which would require listed companies to provide the exchange with the number of non-affiliate shares that are subject to trading restrictions. And, and, and the reason NASDAQ is doing this is, one, because they want to they, they make sure if there's unusual trading activity, what, what's going on. But it once again goes back to NASDAQ's greatest concern about, about the liquidity and making sure that what they consider proper issuers are, are actually on the, their exchange and not just, just, just everyone. And what one thing what we didn't include on, uh, on, on the slides is that if you are an OTC company, so, so you're trading on one of the, the OTC markets, you, you have to show to NASDAQ that you have a minimum trading volume of at least 2,000 shares a, a day for, for the 30 days preceding the, the time in which you, you submit your listing application to, to NASDAQ because once again, NASDAQ wants to make sure that there's there's proper liquidity in your securities but before they allow you to uplist. Right, so for people who want to uplist, yeah. that's going to be a significant concern. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. And last but but, but not least is, is NYSE proposed rules to expand uh, direct listings. Di to direct listings is, is a process that NYSE actually currently up allows, but what they, what they want to do is a, a direct listing basically allows a company to trade on NYSE without going through the traditional IPO process and filing a registration statement. So, so, so NYSE pr proposed rules to, to relax some of their market tests and, and, and di different tests. One of the biggest kind of barriers currently to direct listings is a 400 round lot holder re requirement that's very, very hard for private companies to, to, to achieve. And so NYSE proposed rules that, that they said, hey, we're, we're going to delay looking at that for 90 days because the, the theory is once you're on the market, you, you'll get that round lot holder requirement met pretty easy well, but once you're there. But, 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 but the SEC re rejected the, the, the proposal. They're, they're still in talks. Uh, we, we assume that in some way, shape, or form that this will probably happen, but, but, but NYSE and the SEC are currently in discussion. So that, those are the, are the market updates. Okay. Well, thank you, Anthony and Kimberly. I think this concludes our session. Uh, we are gonna be up here for additional questions. Of course, please feel 
free to email us as well. And happy holidays, everyone.